we believe that Christ would want us to be aware of, some things that he would teach us were he to stand before us and give us those messages. Over the last uh, few months, we've spent ending that uh, time looking at the message that Jesus gave to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. So that's, uh, that's been the course of our year. And as it comes to the wrapping up of what would Jesus teach, obviously, uh, we, uh, we can truly rejoice in the fact that the Savior has been born. And today is a day in which the world remembers that, which Christians are reminded of the birth of our Savior. But I think along with that, we should recognize that there are certain distortions that come with this time of year. Uh, the, the whole concept of observing and celebrating in a secular way the birth of Jesus lacks some real spiritual insight. Not that it's a bad thing, but if we stop and think about it, there's so much that happens during this time that really almost contradicts the message of Christ, of what Jesus would actually teach. For example, we reference exchanging gifts. What did Jesus say about giving? Where's the blessing in giving without receiving? And so the whole concept of exchanging gifts is nice and it's good and it's nice for us to sacrifice and express appreciation. But what Jesus taught was it's not about giving so you receive because, and Jesus even said the, the heathens do that. And are, are we not better than they? So I even think about you know, we hear this, uh, the reason for the season, because this time of year becomes so commercialized and people try to bring us back to some spiritual reference during this time. But you know what? Jesus doesn't want to be the reason for the season. He wants to be the reason for your life. He, he's not a December savior. He's a daily savior. So there's just so much of this, this whole thing that... Although it's good for us to think about, there's so much of it that really presents to us some, some distortions. You know, when a baby is born, when any baby is born, it's so easy to go overboard. At least it is in our house. Because, you know, you, you start seeing all these little outfits and you think, oh, they would look so cute in this. And, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the little one baby gift. And look, Donna's here smiling because she remembers the recent grandmother, how, how that works. You, you just, it's so easy to go overboard. And I think some of that has transpired to us in a spiritual way when we think about Jesus. It's just very easy for us to get over-focused on baby Jesus. And again, he was a child. He went through the process of birth and being born and having a day of birth and growing up. He went through all of that. And as a church, we, we typically don't identify the holiday of Christmas as being anything truly spiritual in nature because there are bigger spiritual issues that Jesus does teach and that he does call us to think about other than just his beginning. And so I believe that one of the things that Jesus would teach today, and wouldn't it be marvelous if Christ were here teaching us today on a day that the world is saying, we're going to celebrate your birth. Wouldn't it be marvelous to hear what he might say? And here's what I'm going to suggest that might be one of his uh, thoughts. It's not about my birth. It's about the purpose of my life. I don't need birthday celebrators. I need lifetime followers. And I think Jesus would say, connect with my birth, not just my birth. Oh, Dan's like that. Webster. Webster says that birth is a sufficient distance for maneuvering a ship. I understand that some of our large aircraft carriers, it takes eight to ten miles to turn them around. Jesus, I think, would want us to know, I am very patient with you. I give you lots of time to maneuver. But I want you to maneuver. I want you to change. I think the birth of Jesus 
would say, I want you to turn. I think the birth of Jesus would also let us know that there's a distance to maintain safety. And I think Christ would say, if you're in my birth, I provide safety for you. We're not going to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. I will be there. I will be the support for you. I will be your savior. That's why I came. I think Jesus would want us to know that's involved in his birth. I think he would also want us to know that I'm a place where you can anchor, where you can be safe. If you tie to me, the storms of life are not going to dis dislodge you. They're not going to carry you away. So I think Jesus would say, my birth provides an anchor. And a birth is also that place where people rest, especially on board of a ship. I think Jesus would say, come to me, all you who are weary and troubled, and I will give you rest. I think the birth of Jesus offers us rest. An informal usage of that word is it's a situation or a position in an organization or an event. By way of example, today's victory clinched a berth for the Huskers in the playoffs. We'd like to hear that. I want you to think about what the birth of Christ does for you in the organization of humanity. What it does for you in the position of eternity. Yeah, I think Jesus would want us to be concerned about his birth, but I don't know that it would be his physical birth as much as the spiritual birth that he extends to us. C.S. Lewis, I think, wrote powerfully of that birth when he said the Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. Son of God became a man. He was born. He, he was born in this world for one purpose so that you and I could become sons and daughters of God. That's his birth. Jesus longs to celebrate our birth into his birth. That's what the gospel is. That word that means good news. Paul said in Ephesians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, the gospel that I preached to you was that Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised again. That's the good news. The good news is that humanity, who is plagued with this thing called death, humanity can escape death. And the reason we can do that is because of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And the means by which we do that we find outlined in Scripture. We die, we bury ourselves, and we are resurrected to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 16 makes that, that imagery perfectly clear. To become born into Jesus' birth, we must die with him. We must bury the dead us, and then we must be raised to walk in newness of life. That's the good news. That is the gospel that Jesus wants us to follow. Look at some passages with me. By his own choice, he gave us a new birth by the message of truth so that we would be the first fruits of his creatures. By Jesus' message of truth, he says, I want to give you this new birth into my birth. John chapter 1. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. I want, I want you just to look at what that says at that point. The passage does not say that everybody that receives Jesus has experienced his blessings of his birth. The passage says that anyone who receives Jesus has also then the right to become a child of God. There is so much more involved in the process of dying and burying and being resurrected with Christ than just receiving him. Jesus says those people have the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but the will of God. Jesus says the way you get my, the benefits of my birth is to be born again. 1 John chapter 3, little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. 
The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin, because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin, because he has been born of God. Folks, here's the benefit of being born into Jesus' birth. We're not capable of committing sin that will cost us our life again. Oh, we're capable of still sinning, but we have an advocate. We have blood that will cleanse us so long as that's our desire. We then become children of God. And I love the part where it says, the seed remains in him. His seed. Who is the seed of God? Christ. Christ remains in us. The birth of Jesus. But when the goodness and love of man appeared to from God our Savior, who was that? Christ. When Christ appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration, a new birth. Not just a physical birth, not just even a spiritual, a birth into his birth. He saved us by this washing of regeneration and a renewal of the Holy Spirit. Most of us in this assembly have heard the message of truth. We've, some of us cut our teeth on that. We've heard that message for years. Most of us have received him and have accepted the, the right to become children of God. Most of us in this room have been born of God so that his seed lives in us. Most of us have received his washing through the washing of regeneration, of renewal by the Holy Spirit. Most of us have accomplished that. Most of us have taken that gospel and we have obeyed similar actions as Jesus presented us in the gospel. We have done that. But the truth is, not everyone has. You know, when we read through the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, we oftentimes talk about invitations. Are you aware that the only invitation in the Bible was right in the middle of a sermon? The only invitations are recorded in the scriptures right in the middle, where they interrupted Peter and said, what must we do? Uh, and Peter told them. We have looked at some of the things about being born into Jesus. And I think if Jesus were here today, when the world is thinking about his physical birth, I think he would say, you need to be thinking about your spiritual birth so that you can enjoy the benefits of my birth, that I'm making those things available to you. So, like the day of Pentecost, we're going to offer an invitation now. And if you have not done that, and you understand, and you've comprehended that, and that's your desire, you may not have come prepared for that, but we have warm water. I'm looking at Dennis. He's shaking his head. We have warm water. We have clothing that you can put on. We have towels that you can dry off with. You can today be born into Jesus' birth. And what a great opportunity to do that. We're going to sing the song softly and tenderly. I'm going to ask everybody just to remain seated. As we sing the song, if the Lord has touched your heart in some way, that you desire to experience his birth, if you'll just raise your hand, and you don't have to raise it up and jump up and down, just raise your hand easily, and we'll come and talk and make plans to get that accomplished. After we sing this song, we will also have the opportunity to observe the Supper of the Lord, where we celebrate that birth that, uh, that we have in Christ. In considering the birth that Jesus offers us to live in, it's a bigger subject than just our spiritual birth. We look at this passage again in Titus. He saved us not of works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It's not just a matter of being born again. It's a matter of staying renewed. We look at that word in the original language, it's actually compounded from two different Greek words, the first one meaning up and the second one meaning new or fresh. 
What is uh, unusual, though, is the preface there, Anna, when that's added as a prefix to a word, it actually carries with it the idea of repetition, intensity, or reversal. So what we need is we are in need of a continual renewal. We are in need of a freshness, a spiritual freshness in our spiritual journey that keeps us connected over and over again. Today, I think if Jesus were here, he would address those who have not yet been born into his birth with an invitation for them to do that. But I think there are those who have been born again who he would remind that it is about how passionate you choose to remain about me. It is about how diligent you are in staying renewed and maintaining that spiritual fervor. 1 Peter chapter 2, so rid yourselves of all wickedness and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the unadulterated spiritual milk so that you may grow by it into salvation. Growing in salvation involves eating. It involves changing. It involves renewal. Peter lets us know that. I think Jesus would warn his followers today that they need to avoid the things that will kill their spiritual passion. Because since it is about our desire to stay renewed in spiritual things, if we allow our passion to be depleted, that renewal ceases. And if that renewal stops, the reason for our rebirth becomes pretty mute if we're not continuing to grow. And so this morning, I think Jesus would want us to know that there are things that are out to assassinate our passion. And I want to cover seven of those this morning, the first one being this. I think one of the things that kills our passion for Jesus has to do with the way we choose to schedule things. An unbalanced life schedule attacks spiritual passion. It is so easy to major in minors. It is so easy for us to focus on things that are of temporal value. Not no value, but only temporal value. Rather than the things that are of eternal value. You remember when we first began the year, I brought out this rope. And I said this rope represents life. But it was only this much that represented our physical life. And this much represented what? Eternity. We spend so much thought and time on this. When we need to be thinking about this. And I think that one of the things that kills our spiritual passion is we get our schedules mixed up. We make our priorities incorrect. And as a result, we feel very tired and very weary, but the reason we're weary is not over spiritual things. We're weary over things of this world. James says, so for a person who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is a sin. You see, James is saying, this spiritual passion stuff needs to be real. And if we know what we need to be doing and we're not choosing to do it, we're not scheduling to do that, then that, can, that becomes sin to us. 1 Timothy chapter 4, But have nothing to do with irreverent and silly myths. Rather, train yourself in godliness. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Timothy, you can get wrapped up in stuff that doesn't matter. And you need to be diligent in training yourself in this spiritual passion. You need to schedule yourself on spiritual things. The Living Bible paraphrase says, spend your time and energy in the exercise of keeping spiritually fit. Paraphrased, but that is the idea that's behind that. Let's think about where we are in our spiritual passion and in our scheduling as we concentrate and encourage each other with the song, Highest Place. We place you 
on the highest place for you are the great high priest we place you high up I believe another passion assassin is buried talents. Abilities that God has given us that get shelved because of apathy or busyness, those things kill spiritual fervor. If God has gifted us so as to use a gift in a spiritual way and we neglect that, how can we maintain our renewed passion for Jesus? 1 Peter chapter 4, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. God has given you a gift. Who's, Paul, who's Peter writing to? Persecuted Christians. Chris mentioned earlier the crosses we have to bear. One of the best ways that we can bear a cross is to be focused on how we can serve someone else. And here Peter says, we've all received gifts. Gifts varying degrees, but we can use those to serve one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul will write, we have different gifts, but the same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different activities, but the same God is active in everyone and in everything. We're not investing what God has put in us. We will not maintain our spiritual passion. We will lose the fervor. So I think Jesus would want us today to know that we need to be looking at the gifts that we have and we need to be concentrating and evaluating how well we are using those gifts that he has given. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free tell me thy secret help me bear the strain of toil the fret of care help me the slow of heart to move by some clear winning word of love. Teach me the way, what feet to stay, and guide them in the homeward way. Teach me thy patience still.
Third thing that I think attacks our spiritual passion, our renewal, is when we live with unaddressed sin. Few things rob of joy, confidence, and passion, and enthusiasm more than sin. We get disgusted with ourselves, those who attempt to conquer sin. We get disgusted with ourselves when we sin. We know we should have done better. We know we should not have done whatever. Sin disgusts us. But it, it can so easily turn into a depleted renewal and spiritual fervor. Listen to the psalmist's description of what guilt does. My guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sins. I am bent over and racked with pain all day long. I walk around filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me and my health is broken. I am exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. We need to deal with our sins. God has made it very plain that when we belong to him, that the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us. But it only does that when we function with the full realization of our sin. If we deceive ourselves and think we're not sinning, then the truth is not in us. So what God expects of us is to honestly evaluate where we're at, to address the sin that we have, to confess that to him, to allow him to again blanket us in the Savior's blood, and to enjoy forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and his truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we want to maintain our spiritual fervor, we need to be honest about our own sinfulness. And we can do that when we kneel at the cross. Because at the cross, we're all equal, and we all are, have the same need, and that's the need for the blood of Jesus. Would you like to stand? We've been sitting for a long time. Why don't we stand as we sing this song? Kneel at the cross, Christ will meet you there. He intercedes for you. Lift up your voice, leave with him your care, and begin life anew. Kneel at the cross, leave every care. Kneel at the cross, Jesus will meet you. cross. Give your idols up. Look unto realms above. Turn not again to life's sparkling cup. Trust always in his love. Need at the cross. Leave every care. the cross, Jesus will meet you there. You can be seated. Conflict drains spiritual passion. While you cannot control another person, you can always control yourself. So how we respond in situations of conflict will have a great, uh, great influence on our ability to maintain our spiritual passion. Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 5, if you're going to pre present your offering, your gift, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, you leave your gift and you go and make things right. Resolving conflicts is part of maintaining our spiritual passion. Angry words. They should never be allowed to linger. Let's uh, sing this together. Angry words, so oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the Love each other, love each other.
is the Father's blessed command. Love each other, love each other, tis the blessed command. Love is much to pure and holy, friendship is to sacred heart. For a moment's reckless folly, thus to desolate and mar. Love each other, love each other, tis the Father's blessed command. Love each other, love each other, tis the blessed command. Angry words are lightly spoken, bitterest thoughts are rashly stirred, brightest links of life are by a single hand. Love each other, love each other, tis the Father's blessed command. Love each other, love each other, tis the Number five, another thing that will destroy our spiritual passion is unhealthy networks. If you want to grow your spiritual passion, you need to surround yourself with people of spiritual passion. If we don't, we cannot maintain our spiritual passion. God knew what he was doing when he established the coming together of saved people on a weekly basis so that they could encourage and uplift each other and challenge each other. He knew what he was doing. Because we need to be around that kind of spiritual passion if we're going to maintain our own spiritual passion. Ecclesiastes has a principle that would apply here. Two are better than one because they get a good return, a reward for their efforts. And if either fails, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. You see, when we're together, we, we have the ability to lift each other up. We don't come together because we're so good and perfect. We come together because of our spiritual need. We know Jesus satisfies. We know we can encourage and help each other. So we come together and we have that benefit when we come together. Also, if two lie down, they can keep warm. But can one person alone keep warm? And if somebody overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is, he is not easily broken. So if we're wanting to maintain our spiritual passion, we need to be around people that are passionate about their spirituality. We are a part of a family. We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now a part of a family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. When a brother meets sorrow, we all feel his grief. When he's passed through the valley, we all feel relief together in sunshine 
to gather in rain, to gather in victory through his precious name. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. Amen. Uncertain purposes will also diminish our spiritual passion. Why are you here? What's your purpose for existence? I'm not asking why you're sitting where you are today. What's your reason for living? What excuse do you have to draw air? Why are you here? What's your purpose? You see, if we're going to maintain spiritual passion, Jesus has to be the reason, not for the season. He's got to be the reason we're here. He's got to be the reason. Our spiritual roots need to go down to him, and he will become that which sustains us through all the burdens and all the trials and all the crosses that Chris talked about. An uncertain purpose will drain us quickly. So then, my dear brothers, Paul will write, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear, phobos, and trembling, tromos. I want you to recognize it is so important for you to recognize the purpose you're here. You need to approach this with fearfulness. You need to have all kinds of phobia about your spiritual purpose. Folks, it's pretty easy for us to get phobias about this life. We need to, be, we need to have a phobia of our spiritual purpose. And I want you to tremble. I want you to tremble because you're trying to ascertain... What does Jesus want of me? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Why? Because it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to will and to act for his good purpose. Lord, take control. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you, take control. I give my body a living sacrifice. Lord, take control, take control. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you, take control. I give my body a living sight. And lastly, I want to suggest that one of the things that will inhibit our renewal ability is an undernourished spirit. Uh, life circumstances seek to shrink our passion, and they want to shrivel our spiritual heart. And there's only one way to maintain that spiritual passion amid that kind of situation, and that is we need to nurture ourselves. We need to continually be feeding our spiritual person. Elements that are involved in that spiritual nourishment. Number one, we need to keep our eyes upon Jesus. Uh, the vision that takes, that draws us away from Christ will deplete our passions so quickly. The cares of this world are said to have choked out that newly sprouted seed in Genesis, or in Matthew chapter 13. Why? 
because it took their focus, took their focus away. When you and I keep our eyes upon Jesus, we'll find that we'll be able to maintain ourselves, to nurture ourselves. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. That's exactly what the Hebrew writer says. We need to consider Jesus because if we don't, we're going to lose heart. If we don't think when our lives are, are amuck and when sin and is it working on us and when all of life is coming down on us, if we don't look to Jesus as the one who endured, the Hebrew writer says we're going to grow weary and lose heart. That's losing our spiritual passion. So in our struggle against sin, we have not resisted to the point of shedding blood. None of us have encountered what Jesus encountered. We need to keep our vision fixed on him because he nurtures us because of what happened in his life. So we turn our eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full on his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Another thing we can do to maintain our spiritual nourishment is not only keep our eyes upon Jesus, we need to do what is right. We need to do what is right. My father-in-law used to have a saying when he would challenge people, and he would ask, have you ever regretted doing right? And no one was ever able to say yes. Now, we have a lot of regrets about doing wrong, but no, nobody's ever regretted doing what's right, as painful as it might be, as demanding, as sacrificial as it may be. So when we do what is right, we feed our spiritual person. Brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Another element of keeping ourselves nourished is that we need to keep ourselves in his truth. The message that Jesus gives us is a written message. He was the word embodied. He told the disciples that he was going to send the spirit and he would remind them all things that he had taught them. They spoke those things. They recorded those things. We have a record of those things. And so we need to put ourselves into Jesus' truth if we're going to maintain and be nourished Sanctify them in truth, Jesus prayed. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctified myself for them, so they also may be sanctified by truth. Ancient words, holy words, words that sanctify us. We need to be nurturing ourselves on the words of our master. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world they resound with god's own heart oh let the ancient words impart words of life words of hope give us strength help us cope in this world where'er we roam ancient words will guide us home ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart holy words of our faith handed down to this age come to us through sacrifice oh heed the ancient words of christ holy words long preserved for our walk in this world they resound with god's own heart oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient
that words impart. And another element of keeping ourselves nurtured is to keep ourselves assembled. You know, when we read of Jesus in his beginning of his ministry, it talks about him going into the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his habit. Jesus had a habit. He nurtured himself spiritually. If the Son of God needed that, so do we. Let us consider, be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encourage each other and all the more as we see the day approaching. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. We need to assemble so we can admonish one another. Passion killers, scheduling issues, buried talents, unaddressed sin, unresolved conflict, unhealthy networking, uncertain purposes, and undernourished spirits. I think Jesus would end this year by teaching us to remain passionate. And don't let anything stand in the way of your passion for Christ. Jesus invites those who have been spiritually reborn to stay powerfully passionate. Anyone's discipleship walk can be depleted by any number of situations, but we are the ones, we are the individuals who hold the key to connecting again with the birth of Jesus Christ. We now offer an opportunity for us to recommit ourselves to the passion of Jesus. As we sing together, not being ours any longer, we say, Savior, I want to be passionate about you. Let's stand together and let's encourage each other with the words of this song. I am mine no more. I've been bought with blood. I am mine no more. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And he rose my life. Jesus is my Lord. He will come again. He will come again. And he'll take